the question of whether uh, how far Shakespeare is part of or implicated in um, notions of national prestige or national identity and how that plays outside the UK, uh, whether it's a help or a hindrance, whether to Shakespeare or whether to people whose job is to further the interests of, of the UK outside the UK. So we have a dazzling selection of panelists. Um, I have to apologize for the absence of James Morris MP. Any of you who've tuned in specifically to see James Morris MP, um, he uh, has an important post in the whips office of the current government. But, um, he will uh, of course remain in contact with us uh, and um, he's very keen on Shakespeare, uh, as indeed is the Prime Minister, uh, perhaps notoriously so, uh, in some contexts. Uh, anyway, uh, making up for the absence of James Morris, we have uh, the Reverend Dr. Paul Edmondson, Head of Research at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, uh, which draws literary pilgrims from all over the world. Uh, we have Kelly Hunter, MBE, head of flute theatre, who could have been in almost any of the panels of this uh, conference, because she does so many things, but, but uh, she takes her international company to international festivals. She does uh, therapeutic Shakespeare via Zoom across national borders, and she has experience of touring with the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, which uh, is also of interest. Uh, we also have, um, and this is a, a very great privilege, Professor Claudia Olk, uh, the president of the Deutsche Shakespeare Gesellschaft, the director of the Forschungsbibliothek Shakespeare München, uh, the great Shakespeare library in Munich, set up with the help of the Shakespeare Institute in 1964, uh, and um, a professor, and um, and you know, just generally a, a really very good and articulate thing, um, and a frequent guest at the Institute whenever that international travel is remotely possible. Uh, we also have Shi Hui Wang, uh, the director of the Royal Shakespeare Company's massive and ambitious project to translate a large number of Shakespeare's plays into Mandarin in a more actor-friendly translation and have them performed in China and indeed uh, to take touring productions in English around China with surtitles as well. And uh, Sir Sebastian Wood, uh, who's only at the end because he's got a, a, a name that begins with W and, and then goes O instead of E, um, himself uh, hereditary RSC and that his father was an associate artist and who has taken those thespian skills uh, into trying to make it sound as though the British government has a cogent foreign policy over the last X years. Uh, and it was British ambassador in China just when the RSC were getting interested in China was then British ambassador in Germany. Um, you know, so, uh, which, which makes him, you know, I think probably the, the most envied ambassador um, since those are two really very, very good jobs. Uh, uh, you know, they kill you, but, but uh, they're highly prestigious. Uh, good, so um, everybody is going to take one question each. And then if there's any time left, there will be a complete free for all. Uh, so first, uh, over to Chris, who is going to interrogate Paul. Thank you so, so much, uh, Michael. Uh, I'm going to ask the obvious and inevitable question, I guess. Uh, first, Paul, um, would you sh say the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust uses soft power as a way of reaching out to and connecting with its international networks? And how does it tap into Shakespeare's cultural capital for the purposes, would you say, of maximising its reach? across national and indeed social borders. So uh, thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for convening this panel. Thank you for inviting me to take part on behalf of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. I think we will be looked at and people will think that we're using soft power, but I don't think we go out to use it deliberately. And so I think I'd, I'd want to just question the use of the word soft power but say a little bit about what we do do, and then people can decide whether it's soft power or not. <laughs> and I'd also like to challenge the phrase cultural capital as well, because I think we need to think about that quite carefully. Yeah, that's I'll, why we're I'll, here. I'll, we're here to challenge yeah, the so preconceptions, I'll, 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 absolutely. I'll start, I'll start with cultural capital, because I think that's, that's what the Birthplace Trust's point of origins were, and what we stay true to. And if we're calling it capital, 
then that which we are invested in is the power of Shakespeare's language and his poetry and his plays. And I think we need to be really clear about that when we're talking about issues of soft power and why, how people are using Shakespeare. And I think anyone talking about soft power and what they do needs properly to think about why Shakespeare and how would they, how they would answer that question. Now, we're very clear that Shakespeare is a great poet. Whether or not he translates as a great poet is another question. But I think people gather to the Shakespeare Centre in Stratford-upon-Avon and take part in our activities and want to visit the Shakespeare houses because Shakespeare is a great poet. Nationalism aside for a moment, that's why we began as an organisation and that's what we stay true to. Now, internationally, audiences come to us from university groups, from international schools, uh, they are perhaps members of the International Shakespeare Association, which the Birthplace Trust holds and uh, has the executive directorship of, and that's many, many hundreds of people around, thousands of people around the world uh, are, are part of the, the ISA, and they take part in the World Shakespeare Congress once every five years. The next one's coming up in Singapore in July this year. We take part in the birthday celebrations for Shakespeare annually and help to lead them, which include international representations. Um, and we have an international collection, which means that since we started in 1847, we've been the receiver of quite random gifts, mm -hmm. un unlooked for, as you know, as gifts should be, you know, the, the, in the true nature of gift. Um, and a PhD student of ours who's registered with Birmingham City University, Helen Hopkins, is making a really groundbreaking and special study of our international collection. And she's unpacking the occasion for each of these, these gifts having been given to us and in asking culturally what was going on there at that particular moment in that particular uh, political climate. Uh, and it's a fascinating discussion. Of course, it includes questions and, and issues of, of soft power. Uh, so that's what we stand for, and that's what we do. Uh, one example of uh, how we are a meeting place for perhaps other writers internationally would be the annual celebrations, which took place only on the, the 8th of May, just gone, of Rabindranath Tagore, the, the Nobel Prize winning Indian poet. And we sell, we, 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 we accepted the invitation to have a, a bust of Tagore in the garden of the birthplace back in the 1980s. And every year, um, fans of Tagore from India and the UK gather and, and note and celebrate his birthday. And then arising from that a few years ago, uh, a pupil of Tagore, the Pakistani national poet, Dr. Sir Muhammad Iqbal, um, his um, institution within the UK awarded us a, a special plaque with his sonnet about Shakespeare on it. Um, and it's extraordinary to me how at one end of the birthplace garden you have Tagore and then across the other side of the birthplace garden you have Muhammad Iqbal and Shakespeare sort of holds the two together. Also in the garden, there is a statue from China of Tang Zhang Zhu, the court playwright who died the same year as Shakespeare. Now, if that sounds like soft power, which I suspect it does, um, I don't think we're doing it deliberately. Again, we're doing it because people want to gather around Shakespeare because he's a great poet. So let's be clear about his greatness. He makes us feel bigger as human beings. He's so generous and so broad-minded in his worldview. I don't think it's the case that he speaks for every single um, aspect of our humanity. That's a, 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 stere a stereotype and a, and a nonsense when one starts to break it apart. But I do think he speaks to um, emotions which we all share and articulates them supremely. And that is our starting point. And of course, people of all nations who want to understand and enjoy Shakespeare's stories 
and his language more in their own language um, can help us celebrate his greatness. That's wonderfully eloquent as always, Paul. And it just brings home, doesn't it, this, the importance of going beneath the labels to the more kind of nuanced reality beneath the surface, which is always much more interesting in so many ways. Thank you very much. Rowan, do you want to drag Kelly into the discussion? <laughs> oh, I feel it would only be appropriate, wouldn't it, really? Um, and obviously, Kelly, I know you, you've been doing um, amazing work for audiences with autism, and I'm very fortunate that I've been able to share in those, actually, not just in the UK, but in Barcelona a few years ago, and also to see one of your recent uh, works in Peru. Um, and obviously you, you've worked very internationally for many, many years and, and in the pandemic indeed have sort of stepped that up even further, I think it's safe to say. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of to what extent does your work rely on, on the, the appeal of, of cultural capital or, or Shakespeare's, you know, um, name in terms of uh, engaging with people on an international basis and, and how that plays into the work that you do with children children who are on the autistic spectrum god i've been on zoom since march 2020 you'd think i'd know to unmute myself uh thank you so much rowan uh thank you so much for having me on this on this esteemed panel it's my privilege um paul i loved what you just said it, it actually um you really uh, were able to articulate uh, what I feel as well uh, about my company and in relation to soft power. So when I knew I was coming on this panel, I had a good think about soft power. And as I understand soft power, it is any means to retain or develop power that isn't hard power, i.e. anything that isn't war. So any means of of claiming territoriality and and maintaining your place in the world, especially as a nation state or an empire. Uh, and it's could be summed up as branding. So you brand something and you sell it for free uh, or sometimes for a lot of money and you gain uh, influence. And before I started this work with um, my work, which explores how Shakespeare can be used with autistic individuals and their families to wake up the spirit to, as Paul so beautifully said, makes us feel like bigger, makes us feel bigger as human beings. Beautiful thing to say. For me, that that is exactly what Shakespeare's gift to us is. Uh, I loved what you said, Paul. You know, it's not everything. That's ridiculous. It, it's not everything, but it does make us feel that we know ourselves more. And as an actor at the Royal Shakespeare Company over two decades ago, I found myself completely at odds with the productions that I was in. And by that I mean they didn't really matter. What was on stage, what was being explored in the rehearsal room, didn't matter, not in the way that my work matters to me. And it didn't matter because it was being packaged up branded, plonked on the stage and sold to the world as this Shakespeare thing. Uh, I didn't think of it as soft power then, but thinking back on it, I really know that it was. The Royal Shakespeare Company do something called Shakespeare in a Suitcase, which if you Google all sorts of luxury websites that say uh, if you've got a lot of money, what you can buy, you can buy the RSC's Shakespeare in a suitcase, which gives you six actors turning up in your penthouse flat in New York uh, and doing some Shakespeare while you eat caviar and drink champagne. Most of them have come out of the address book of Susie Sainsbury. And I couldn't bear that. I couldn't bear that Shakespeare was being used and branded and, and in doing so, lost all its meaning and value at worst it didn't matter that actors were messing about it didn't matter no one really cared so that led me to uh set up uh, a question for myself um could i use shakespeare for people who have no idea who shakespeare is 
people with no access to the arts whatsoever. And long story short is I created this, this way of working with autistic individuals using the heartbeat, using the mind's eye, uh, which I've been doing on and off for the last 20 years. Now I run Flute Theatre and we do go around the world, especially during the pandemic. We do it in many different languages. Um, it's entirely dependent on subsidy. It makes no money because we do it for one person at a time at the moment of the pandemic. So we're not selling anything. I artistically feel that I will always be in a state of becoming with Shakespeare. This is more mysterious to me now than it, than it ever was before. So I've uh, developed my relationship with Shakespeare and performance with these audiences who have no idea, some of them non-verbal, but remarkably will access something that brings us together in the space. Uh, so in answer to your question, do I depend on Shakespeare to go to Peru and India, where we're now working? Actually, no, not, not in the work that I do. My work uh, is, is inspired by Shakespeare. And certainly, as I've sort of um, said, inspired by what I don't think Shakespeare, for me, um, means. And I've found my own way, slowly but surely, to to carve uh, an artistic endeavor that that genuinely allows Shakespeare to live without the baggage of needing to persuade anybody that Shakespeare is any good. I'm not persuading anybody that Shakespeare is any good, and I'm not using Shakespeare as a means to travel. <laughs> um, absolutely not. So. Um, one really interesting thing is I, I have three productions. They take a long time to make my productions. The last thing I'd say on this is I have three productions, The Tempest, Midsummer Night's Dream and Pericles, which I've created uh, painstakingly for, for the autistic community and their families and people with special needs. And theatres around the world were very happy to have my Midsummer Night's Dream and my Tempest. But then when I said to uh, the Orange Tree Theatre and the Bridge Theatre, or oh, our next show is Pericles, they said, oh, don't do that because we can't sell it. And all I was doing was a production for 15 autistic people, which to be honest with you, don't know whether they're coming to see Henry the Sixth Part Three or Love's Labour's Lost. But the theatre itself was still in such a mindset that it said that Pericles would be a really bad idea because they couldn't sell it. Uh, so we live in a world, as far as I'm concerned, with uh, where Shakespeare is branded up to the height. I think Shakespeare is the greatest um, ex uh, export of this country. And I found my way to somehow, like Paul, um, keep, keep an endeavour, as I said, a state of becoming, so I'm still investigating what Shakespeare can give me. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. And I think that's so important, that, that the state of becoming and, and the fact that you know, it, there isn't a, a sort of universality and that, that Shakespeare is the same to everybody or, or should be the same to everybody or needs to be. Um, and I think that resonates so well. Um, but equally, I think, you know, you raised some, some really fascinating points in terms of, you know, the, the commerciality, I guess, of, of Shakespeare in so many ways and actually what we can and should and, and, and ought to be doing to, to potentially challenge that in, in a lot of instances. So thank you very much. Um, so I believe I'm now going to hand back to Chris. Thank you so much, Rowan, and thank you very much indeed for that, Kelly. Uh, um, I've got, yes, a question to Claudia. Um, I was very excited to hear, Claudia, about um, the fact that you're currently working on a project to have Shakespeare's works recognised as part of UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage of the world. And I just want, wondered if you could tell us a bit more about that, why you feel Shakespeare needs to be recognised in this way. I mean, what does it actually mean to be for Shakespeare's works to be recognised as part of this intangible cultural heritage, and why do we need that? Uh, thank you. Yes, um, I mean, as, as most of you are aware, Shakespeare is, of course, a, a, a strong force, not just a soft power, but a, a power, period, for German uh, culture as such. Shakespeare made in Germany is what James Joyce uh, writes in, in Ulysses, yes, and, and of course there has been an unprecedented enthusiasm from 1750 onwards and it led up to the foundation of the German Shakespeare Society in 1864. 
Yeah, and then equally um, yeah, enthusiastic and, and, and creative is the reception, the adaptation of the works of William Shakespeare in the world's performance culture for the past 400 years, in music, in ballet, in the visual and the plastic arts. And um, we think in conjunction with, of course, the Shakespeare Institute, Stratford, which has always been a partner of German activities, Shakespeare studies in Munich is an excellent example for this. Michael mentioned it earlier on that Sir Stanley Wells was present at the foundation of the Munich Shakespeare Library. And we are trying to intensify and continue those um, efforts and initiatives and applying um, for the works of of the performance culture of uh, William Shakespeare's works to be listed as intangible cultural heritage with the UNESCO is uh, one of the goals that we are pursuing. Um, and we were surprised at first this hadn't been done already uh, because we have such a, a truly sort of worldwide performance culture of Shakespeare and a truly global phenomenon in, in you know, um, worldwide. And so we, we think this is a, a good moment and high time that this has to be done. How do you actually do that? I mean, do you pin mm -hmm. certain um, productions and say, yes, this is intangible cultural heritage, we need to preserve that for a future generation. I mean, how, what, what are the practicalities of actually making that happen? First of all, there's a lot of, you know, um, <laughs> I might say bureaucracy also involved um, with uh, several representatives of the UNESCO in um, the UK and Germany, and this has to be a joint effort. And of course, all we have to rely on all our sources are sort of recorded performances and um, archives and theatre archives and, and this kind of thing. We don't necessarily intend to make a, a harsh selection. You know? We just want to performance practice of theatrical performances of the works of William Shakespeare in theatres and festivals. Festivals. That is sort of the core activity um, for Thank our you. project, which hopefully comes to fruition. Yeah, that sounds fantastic and uh, a, a worthwhile endeavor. Wish you the very best with that. I'm sure we'll be keeping in touch with how you get along with that project. Brilliant. Um, so fascinating to hear about so much that, that is going on. Um, Shiri, I wonder if we could come to you now for a moment just to talk about, um, obviously in the UK, we're, we're quite used to the state providing a sort of certain amount of subsidy for, for live Shakespeare, but obviously that does come with, with certain constraints. I'm sure there are plenty of people on this panel who would also like to speak to that, but I'm going to ask you the question initially. Um, so I just wonder in, in your experience of the project that you're working on with the, the RSC Folio Translation work, um, how far the Chinese government's embraced Shakespeare and, and how that has worked in practice. Thank you, Ron, for the question and thank you for having me here. Um, I think we all agree that Shakespeare is perhaps one of the most profitable intellectual property as part of the kind of English culture. Um, and and it is it is um, it is a human it's a it's in its humanity um, that shines through um, that shares the story across the globe um, and I think in 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 my observation before the RSC project which we started in 20, 2015 Shakespeare was known as a cultural figure in the cultural circle in China, but by no means a, a kind of a household name. So um, when in 2015, this unprecedented ambitious project was launched, kind of providing a grant uh, from the government um, to lots of um, national portfolio companies, we, are, we, were, we were part of the beneficiaries um, of that scheme as the background of the UK, China golden era. I'm sure Sebastian, you're very familiar with that term 10 years ago it was a golden era um and 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 to come up with idea uh, rather effectively to find the most effective and powerful project and ip that we have um and to 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 engage the chinese partners um in this way so uh, for the rsc at the time we launched three projects uh shakespeare folio translation project was one um, and uh, there was a Chinese classical translation project, which was kind of a typical translation uh, creative uh, project, um, translating all the plays um, of Shakespeare contemporary in China and um, performing on contemporary stage in, 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 in the RSC and in, 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 in the UK. The third project was to take um, um, three productions uh, to China uh, in 2016. So um, coming back, so this is, 
this is a very, so it's a very rather balanced curation of how we use the fund um, of the government fund to make sure that it is an exchange rather than an imperialistic exercise that very, very often RSC is being accused or very often when, when we do bring one cultural idea or symbol um, to another culture, it could be seen that way. And UK is a culprit of that um, because of its um, glorious history um, of, you know, what it, um, the glorious history. Full stop. Um, so I'm um, coming back to the <laughs> project um, that um, it, it is very ambitious that our goal uh, is to produce Mandarin translations of the first folio for stage performances. And, and it's through a collaborative new translation process. And I want to bring this conversation more to kind of an artistic and personal level, because this is actually the first time in the history of the RSC, I believe that Shakespeare's plays has been translated with such a methodology on such a scale and with another culture. So it's a very in-depth and inventive way of, of doing Shakespeare. Um, and it's not to kind of present it, but it is to um, really engage and to challenge and, and find the gap and feel the gap and celebrate the gap of Shakespeare, of language, and of a lot of um, understandings and misunderstand misunderstandings. And um, so the project was devised by Gregory Doran, our artistic director. And, um, and we have throughout this six years, yeah, six years, we had a year of gap. So five years of the project in active, um, we have, um, produced six productions, um, um, Henry V would be in the first one, very precarious title. Um, and um, uh, we had Hamlet, King Lear, um, Tempest, um, Twelfth Night, um, Merry Wives, um, Temp uh, Merry Wives and Twelfth Night and um, Merchant of Venice. So a lot of, a lot of um, um, productions have been made um, and we worked with 10 different organizations and drama schools, um, brought over 20 British art artists to kind of work in China. So it was um, on, the, on the kind of people to people level, um, um, it was a very incredibly challenging process to work in the rehearsal room and actually to produce these Shakespeare. It is by no means a, a walk in the park. It is more like a battle in the, in the Argincourt. Uh, in in rehearsal, um, and and I use that I use that image really carefully and deliberately because I vividly remember the first um, project of Henry V that the effort that we have to make to uh, explain the stories and to actually explain the stories to the actors why we're making this show now why it's relevant to your life because it's probably the most removed story to the Chinese audience and to the actors of the, the story of a king going to war and why is it relevant and why are we making it apart from there is this overarching um, uh, cultural diplomacy exchange. So there was a huge effort of, of explaining um, that Henry V was not a, a story of, of going to war of English history. It is a story of, of, of a young king, of a young person um, coming of age story. It's a st story of struggle with your identity. It's a st story of, 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 of um, 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 understanding uh, what it means to fulfill your responsibility in a situation that you, you perhaps don't understand or don't, um, a complex situation that you don't, uh, can't grasp fully. So um, to explain that cultural context was a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. And also then the other thing was, how do we uh, translate and work with the Chinese actors and the translators on the language and, mm -hmm. and on the verse? So that was actually the core of this project was really to, um, through uh, sharing ideas of how now we, um, the, 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 the British directors, unpick the clues of the Shakespeare, to share their experiences, to reinvent the music uh, of the language, and through this process, um, really to find a new, a new, new language, a new rhythm in, 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 in China. And the wonderful thing is that we can see how, we cannot replicate, but how the meaning and sense and the music of language and the interpretation of Shakespeare can change and evolve and metamorphosize to something else in another cultural context. I think that's the key thing and the most exciting thing um, for us. Um, and, and on the other hand, um, I also want to say one thing that we, we, we say that it's an act of soft power, um, but on the other hand, I think the Chinese audience demand authenticity as well. 
So it's, they want an original version. They do want this power. They want an original version of the power though. So hmm. when we want to bring another idea of, of a contemporary Shakespeare or of what is Shakespeare in its essence, it's performance rather than literature. When we challenge that idea, uh, uh, some directors, it were met with some kind of rejection from both the academics and the directors, old school directors who devoutly believe that Shakespeare should be performed in a wig with actors speaking in declamation and in a very translated uh, sense. There were still, uh, there were still directors um, who do produce Shakespeare in that way and audience appreciate. Mm. So I guess that, that's a very, um, that's from my observation, from my practice, yep. um, um, how, I would, how, how I would tell this story. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great story. And um, those of you who want to see what happened when a Chinese cast did Henry V in Chinese in front of a young Chinese audience with no idea of what was going to happen at the end, um, go sign on for the World Shakespeare Congress, where that production of Henry V, and here's the Mandarin translation published by the Shakespeare Center, China and, Nan, and uh, Yilin in Nanjing, um, you know, it's going to be streamed. Uh, you can watch it. It's extraordinary. It was a, a, an amazing event. You know, it was one of the freshest um, uh, rethinkings of Henry V that, that I've ever seen. It was a, it was a great night out. Uh, which brings us, with the clock ticking savagely, uh, to Sebastian, somebody who comes at it from the diplomatic end rather than the Shakespeare end. Um, in your career as a diplomat, to what extent did small talk or even large talk about Shakespeare uh, oil the wheels of trade negotiations? I mean, is it something that the Foreign Office actually explicitly encourages or does it just happen by accident? Um, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I don't think it oils the wheels of trade negotiations in my, in my experience, but let's, let's come back to soft power. Mm. Um, I may be wrong about this, but um, I want to say that about 20 years ago, the American academic Joe Nye defined soft power. Hard power um, is the ability to force other people to do what you want. Uh, soft power is the ability to get other people to want what you want. So it's really, uh, it's about influence, quite simply. And it's to do with your attractiveness uh, to other uh, countries. And at, when I was abroad uh, as an ambassador, first in China and then in uh, Germany, I was very conscious of the fact that I was not just representing a government at a particular point in time. I was representing uh, a country. And I saw it as part of my job to uh, remind um, the, you know, my audience in the country where I was posted of um, some of the strong attributes that the UK uh, enjoys in order to do what I could to remind people of our more sort of attractive uh, aspects and our cultural power um, or our cultural uh, history is undoubtedly very attractive uh, around the world. Um, which aspects of soft soft power are attractive depend a little bit on where you are and what Shi Hui just said about uh, China resonated uh, with me. I mean I, I recall a certain amount of Shakespeare related activity when I as, a, as ambassador in uh, China but not a great deal um, and I think the Chinese were more interested actually uh, because of what, what China's current priorities are, more interested in our education uh, strength, our scientific strength, very interested in the fact that we were the first country to have an industrial revolution. Those are the sorts of things that were the elements of soft power that were useful for me as an ambassador in China. But in Germany, um, Shakespeare was uh, more useful. Uh, Claudia has already reminded us that uh, Germany was the first uh, uh, foreign country to establish a, a Shakespeare society. I think that's right, uh, Michael, you'll tell me yeah, if, yeah. if it's wrong. Yeah, yeah. I think that Shakespeare sounds fantastic uh, in German. I, uh, Paul Edmondson asked whether Shakespeare is a, is a great poet, whether his poetry works in other languages. I believe it does work extremely well in German. 
Mm. And that probably has something to do with the fact that, you know, English is essentially a Germanic uh, uh, language. Um, but I, I shamelessly piggybacked on any sort of Shakespeare action that was going on in Germany that I could fit into my schedule in order just to remind uh, people that when they were dealing with the British ambassador, they weren't just dealing with Theresa May's sort of representative or Boris Johnson's representative in the country. They were also dealing with the ambassador of the country, which was the country of uh, Shakespeare. And that's, you know, fair enough. You know, you make the most of your uh, national strengths. And I, I went to some memorable uh, Shakespeare uh, productions, a very famous uh, Lars Eidinger uh, performance as Richard III. He spent quite a lot of it stark naked, I seem to remember, and also so prowling, so prowling in a rather menacing way around the audience and hissing some sort of unmentionable things in the ears of members of the audience, including in my ear at one point. So that was quite memorable. Um, but I also would have occasionally, you know, sort of we, I, one of our uh, 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 Queen's birthday parties, which is what we call um, in a sort of exceptionalist British way, that's what we call our national day parties, uh, was Shakespeare themed um, uh, in the year of the 400th uh, anniversary of his birth. And, um, uh, you know, I would occasionally have sort of bring a, a Shakespeare theme into other events that I might be do, uh, that I might do at uh, my residence, for example. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's remarkable. It's very interesting to think about where Shakespeare fits in with conceptions of British national identity around, around the globe, um, whether we can find some bits of the globe where people have forgotten that Shakespeare was ever English. Um, or, were, or have, have forgotten that industrialism was ever, was ever English um, or British or, or any of those other things. Did you dress up at the Queen's birthday party when it was Shakespeare themed? Well, you, yeah, I mean, I wore I'm, a suit and a tie, yeah, but- Yeah, uh, but not doublet. No, that, not really, no. No, no, that, that's- That's a Shakespearean character. That's a shame. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you felt, well, I mean, it, given the choice between standing in a party as a representative of Boris Johnson or a representative of Shakespeare. Um, you know, to, for some of us, that's a fairly straightforward choice, but, but um, I suppose you're being paid to be both, which is, you know, which, 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 which must be tricky. Um, uh, any of our panelists, do any of you feel that the sense that, that Shakespeare is something tourists want from Britain, along with red telephone boxes. Does, has that ever got in your way? Um, would you like Shakespeare to be simply branded as the world's national poet rather than any, any cultures uh, in particular, which in a way is what the UNESCO application is doing. I mean, the UNESCO application is getting us ready in case we get audited by arts administrators from Vulcan or, or, or wherever. Um, I mean, Claudia, it's interesting for you, of course, in that, that Shakespeare is so deeply embedded in German culture um, to, to the extent that, you know, it, it seems odd to some Germans, I believe, that he ever wrote in English. Yes, but, but it's, I'd also like to see Shakespeare more as a part of the foundational work in the humanities that helps us understand on, and interrogate political annexations of Shakespeare yeah. today or yeah. um, popular culture and uh, to elucidate how also a comparative approach from sort of one nationality to the other and to, to follow these processes of negotiation in, in which Shakespeare then assumes these metamorphic states that have been mentioned before are, yeah. are very interesting to us. And I would like to invite students, doctoral and postdoctoral students to Weimar, I've only just briefly launched a um, Shakespeare scholarship, which is also administered by the Classic Foundation in Weimar, we found on their website, three months, uh, 2000 euros per month, and this is founded by the German Shakespeare Foundation. So encouraging it's, this cultural exchange. Yeah, it's a deal. I'll, um, I'll, I'll apply now. I need, uh, I need the money. Um, but Paul's got his hand up with about 30 seconds left to play. 
Just a reminder then that nobody owns Shakespeare, do they? Mm -hmm. Some some organisations think they do, but no one owns Shakespeare. So to have him as the world laureate seems about right. And also, Mm -hmm. um, Sebastian, I love that soft power is making people want what you want. It seems to me that every time a character opens his or her mouth in a Shakespearean play, we're hearing soft power at work. (laughs) Yeah. Every single one of Shakespeare's sonnets is an exercise in soft power. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I should also just say we've had quite a few questions in the chat. What we'll do is we'll save those and we'll return to those at some point in our future discussions. It's really useful for us just to, to see all the chat and to see the questions, because then we can take those on board moving forward and address those in future sessions and future projects as part of our collaborations. Good. Good. And I hope you'll rejoin uh, this conference this evening at six as we celebrate the career and work of one of the great international Shakespeareans of our of our time, someone who was brilliant at making people want the things he wanted because mm-hmm. they were really good things to want. And that's Jerzy Limon, uh, the founder of the Teatro Shakespeareowski in Gdansk. And that was only something he sort of did in his spare time. Uh, the nearest thing to a uh, uh, you know, a personification of the Renaissance I'm ever likely to meet. Uh, So do come back at six for that. And meanwhile, uh, with warm thanks to all of our panelists um, and, and, uh, you know, may may their soft power succeed in in, uh, uh, making us all want good things uh, in unison. Uh, Thank you very much. And And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.